Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's session on Artificial Intelligence, the World and You. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Philippa Ryan from the University of York, and she's going to take us on a journey through driving the future, AI and transport. Philippa, over to you. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, welcome to this session on AI and transport. As um, it was just said, so my talk is about driving the future, about how we're going to use artificial intelligence in our transport. Um, I'm Philippa Ryan. I do research into making sure we're using AI in a safe way as we possibly can. OK, so let me just start by saying, what do I mean by artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence is really when we use computers to do the complex tasks that we're currently letting humans do. Sometimes we use the word autonomy as well, and that's when the human is replaced by the computer. And here are some sort of typical examples. Um, we might use an autonomous car. So the car might take us um, to our place of work. It might take us to school and we can sit back and relax. Um, sometimes we use AI in our phones to help you symptoms looks after if you finds out if you're unwell you type what how you're feeling into the phone and then it will um tell you what whether it thinks you're unwell and you need to actually see a real doctor sometimes we might just use it for something as trivial as delivering my lunch here's a robot bringing me my pizza okay so what do we mean when we think of ai and transport I think most people will think about personal transport. They'll think about their cars, they'll think about buses and trains, possibly even aeroplanes when they're going on holiday. But there's lots and lots of places where we use transport. So here's some of the other examples. Um, sometimes we might use it to transport goods. Um, so we've got a big ship here full of shipping containers. It can travel across the world autonomously and using AI. Some other places we might use it are farming um, and agriculture. There's a lot of use of it there. So you can use a drone to which with a camera on to inspect your crops. Um, and that can then alert somebody that the crops need are ready to be harvested. So it can link together with an autonomous harvester. We might have um, autonomous trucks, which bring all our goods together. And other places we might use it are things like mining and quarrying, which are very dangerous jobs. And we can take people out of that danger by using autonomous vehicles. So why do we need it at all? So AI, it could replace human drivers. Uh, why might we want to do this? Well, sometimes these jobs are very long and repetitive. People get bored quite quickly. Uh, if they're driving a truck a very, very long way, they get tired. Um, ships on carrying our goods take a very long time to travel around the world um, and they have to be away from home for a very long time. Um, and it could help make things safer. But some people are worried that it's going to take away their jobs. So, and some jobs can be very hard to find new people who want to do it. Um, so we're actually struggling in the UK to find new truck drivers. Um, so we might need autonomous cars because there aren't enough truck drivers. And other jobs can be very dangerous. So we use autonomy and AI to stop them being in a dangerous place. So um, it might be that there's a chemical spill or something like that. And we want to use an AI based machine in order to help take that danger away from an actual human. Where are we using AI at the moment? This has just started this year. This is a driverless autonomous bus on Scotland's fourth bridge. And I've got a short video that I will just quickly show you here. The UK's first autonomous bus service has been launched. Covering a 14 mile route, the CAV fourth trial is thought to be the first registered bus service in the world to use full-size autonomous buses.
we're at the Board of Bridges and uh, we're taking part uh, in a connected and uh, autonomous vehicle trial, uh, Cav Board, which is a historic first and a, a great day for Scotland. And it's great to see that the collaboration that there has been between government, academia and companies across Scotland uh, to make all of this work. It's no secret about the, the amount of money that's been spent on autonomous vehicle development. Billions of dollars have been spent globally on autonomous vehicle development. So to do what we've managed to do here today as a world first bus service and mixed traffic environment operation is, is absolutely downgraded. Okay, so I've got um, two things that I want you to take away from that video. And one is, as you can see, the driver is not touching the steering wheel, but he's still inside the bus. And that's because they have a safety driver who is there at any time to take over from driving if they're worried about, um, if they see an issue and they think the bus hasn't spotted it yet. Um, the other th important thing from that was the amount of money that be is being spent on this. So they talked about billions and billions of dollars and there is a huge amount of money being spent on building all these autonomous vehicles. So where else are we using this? So this is another example. Um, so um, these mini little robots are being trialed in many countries, but including Leeds and Northampton in the UK. Uh, and they've got little lids that you can open and put inside your groceries. And they take the groceries to your house from the shop. And these are great in terms of they're very environmentally friendly. They're uh, stopping small, short drives to the shops. Um, they navigate themselves, although there is a person monitoring them in um, a, an office nearby. And it's also very good for people who can't get to the shops. So it might be difficult for them to get to the shops, but they can still get all their groceries. And it's got lots of technology on board. It's got 12 cameras, radar, and lots of safety monitoring. And this is a very short video showing this video out in Northampton. So this is the robot here. And you can see it's moving along and then it sees some people, so it stops. Uh, people carry on walking and it's still stopped. Um, and then it thinks about moving forward and then a car comes, so it stops again. So it's very, very slow and very cautious at the moment. Okay. So where else are we using this technology? So, for example, in the USA, they have driverless taxis run by Waymo. Um, there are autonomous vehicles in mines being used in Australia and in Finland. The drones I talked about spraying crops and are sowing seeds as well across the globe. This is a small project we're involved with with the University of Lincoln, where there's a little autonomous uh, robot that follows the fruit pickers and allows and collects all the things that they're picking and then takes it back to base, stops them having to bend down and stand up all the time. So there's lots and lots of ways we can use AI and transport. But the problem is we want it to be safe and we want to know what that means. So one way we could think about this is whether it's safer than a human driver. And we might think that it's safer than a human driver because it has less accidents on the road or in the workplace. So that means that we've made things better. The other thing it tends to do is stick to the rules more than we necessarily do. So it will stay on the speed limits and things like that. However, that's not always a good thing. Um, so some of these cars, when they first came out, were very, very slow, and they kept stopping and starting all the time and made the safety drivers inside them seasick because it was just stopping and starting constantly. And it was also very difficult for the other drivers to predict what it was going to do. So they weren't sure if it was going to stop ahead of them suddenly. And there were some accidents because it was trying to be too cautious and too safe. 
So why, why we're managing this is by what we call increasing levels of autonomy. So to bring things on safely, we will start off with very little AI involved. So my car, for example, has some um, lane assistance and it has um, cruise control and it recognizes road signs. But none of these things take over control of the car and it's just what we call level one. It just assists the driver. The bus that we saw, the fourth bridge bus, is what we call level three, which is when we still have a person on board who is ready to take over and take control if something we don't want to happen looks like it might be about to happen. If it, the bus doesn't respond and someone suddenly runs into the road, the driver can take control. Level four are like the little robots that we have. So someone is monitoring it from a distance and it's got a lot of control. But as we saw, it's driving very, very slowly and is very cautious. Uh, so again, we're doing it in a very slow and graded way to introduce the AI and autonomy bit by bit. So the question is, why is it hard? Um, well, most AI uses what we call machine learning. And when I said that it's human complex tasks, they're very, very difficult to describe and program your computer to do. It's very, very hard to tell someone what is a safe driver because there's so many things and people have got different opinions on it. And as well as that, it makes it very, very hard to test because we don't know what we're testing for which is why we have safety drivers sometimes in the car as well. So a little bit more about why machine learning isn't necessarily very intelligent. Okay, so the way it works is the computer is given lots and lots and lots of data. So it might be lots and lots of images, um, or it might be like chat GPT, it's given lots and lots and lots of text and information and it adapts itself towards what it thinks is gonna be the right answer. So for example, let's think about what is a tree? So we might think a tree is quite easy to describe. It's got a trunk, it's got leaves, it might have green on it. Um, so what we need to do is give the computer lots and lots and lots of tree pictures. So here's just some examples. But as you can see, there's lots of variety in what a tree is. So this one, doesn't have much of a trunk on it, but it's got lots of leaves. This is one in winter, so it's white. It doesn't have green on it. This is one on its own. This is one in a forest. There's lots and lots of things. And this is another different type of tree. And we can tell the computer by marking up the images or the text where the important information is. So we've put this box around it and the computer will take all those images or work out what it thinks the key features of a tree are and it will appear to when we'll keep running and running the computer until we think it's spotting the trees in a good enough way but the problem is it might understand what a tree is but it doesn't understand where the tree is it doesn't understand the context so here's a picture of a tree on a bus stop we know it's a bus stop um, we can see that it's on a bus stop, we can see the road next to it, but we don't necessarily expect the computer to understand that. It can see there's a tree there, but it doesn't know that it's on a bus stop. The same with this one on the side of a van. So someone's holding this tree. We know it's not real, but the computer does not. And sometimes, so the autonomous cars, when they first came out, sometimes they were stopping because they saw pictures of people on the side of a bus on the adverts. So it was stopping for something that wasn't real. So this is one of the problems with the ML is it's clever for very small tasks, but doesn't understand the big picture. Why is it so hard? Again, but not only does it need to recognize a tree, it needs to recognize other cars, pedestrians. Look how many pedestrians there are in this picture. Children, dogs, bicycles, needs to work in the fog, in the dark, in the sun, in the rain. We might have broken signs, there might be potholes in the road, that all put it off. And it's going to need lots of supporting technology. 
because it's trying to process lots and lots of data. It needs good 5G so it can contact other vehicles and understand what's going on. And we might need to change how we behave around an autonomous car to, because of how it might break and how it might stop. There's a few other things that we're worried about. Um, we're worried about privacy. Um, autonomous cars, they've got lots and lots of cameras. So they're not just recording what the, ca what the car is doing, they're recording all the people walking alongside the cars. They're recording the other cars. It could track you where you're going. And that information is being shared with a lot of other people. One of the other things we're worried about is who's responsible if there is an accident. So if I'm in my autonomous car and it has an accident, I haven't driven it, but am I responsible for what happens or is the manufacturer responsible? And at the moment, the law doesn't really know what the best way to manage this situation is. And the other big concern is about it taking away jobs from people um, because it can replace jobs that lots of people still want to do, um, as I said. OK, so what is the future? Well, AI and autonomous transport is already here and it's going to get more complex with these higher levels of autonomy. And there's lots of little small examples, but it's going to become more and more used. It does bring some risks and challenges. Uh, the machine learning is not very bright. It's, uh, so there are safety concerns, there are privacy concerns. The cost of developing this is very, very high. Um, and one of the other problems is the environmental cost. So training AI uses a lot of computer resources and actually it can be very environmentally unfriendly. But there are lots of benefits as well. There are potentially safer roads, humans not at risk, tasks that we need doing. It can help older and vulnerable people um, who can't necessarily get out of their houses very well. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very happy to talk through um, some questions that people would have. Would I get into an autonomous bus or car? <laughs> um, I have people, colleagues here who have got into an autonomous car. Um, I haven't personally, I would, but I would prefer there was a safety driver at the moment. So this is the qu another question. So yes, whose fault would it be if the bus or car injured someone? So this is a really interesting question. Um, so when there's a safety driver on board, people would probably say it was the safety driver's fault if they didn't take over in time. When there isn't a safety driver, it's probably the owner's fault at the moment, but based on the insurance, but they would ask the manufacturer to explain. So it, it's still, the law is still being developed to support this at the moment. Is it that AI can't recognize living creatures, pedestrians and animals and has only seen images? Uh, we might train it with videos as well, but yes, it wouldn't be tested before uh, it would be trained, as we call it, on um, lots and lots of images and videos. Um, it would spot in pedestrians walking along, but it would be processing each frame one by one and animals. Some car manufacturers have implemented self-driving models, but there seem to be safety issues. Yes, there are a lot of problems here. When will legislation catch up to ensure everyone's safety? Uh, should legislation have been put in place before self-driving was implemented? So in this country, um, we have just allowed the level two self-driving to be legal. And there are trials of autonomous cars. Uh, we're working with a company here uh, who are running trials in London, but they have a safety driver and they have to get special permission in order to do it. Um, yes, there are a lot of safety issues at the moment. It doesn't always spot people, but it doesn't only use cameras. Uh, it also has radar and LIDAR, which is uh, 
additional information that spots when things are blocking it. It doesn't necessarily know what it is, but it uses the LIDAR and the images together to get a, an understanding of whether there really is something blocking it and in its way. Okay. What career pathway did I follow to get into my job? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so I did a degree in um, computer science, and then I did a PhD um, at the University of York. I worked in industry for a while, doing writing safety cases for um, various different systems, including aeroplanes and um, cars um, and power plant safety. And then I came back to work in academia. So quite a long way round, but the best way if you want to do this is to go and work at university. Okay. If we have self-driving cars, will people still need to learn to drive? I don't know that people will need to learn to drive if we are driving cars um, and we may lose that skill. But people want to learn to drive. That's the interesting thing. People like driving. Um, so that's one thing that might hold back autonomous cars for the future. Did I concentrate on STEM subjects at school for my career? Um, Yes, I did mathematics, um, but I also did music as well. Um, that was one other subject that I really, really enjoyed. But mostly I did concentrate on uh, science subjects and mathematical subjects. Yes. Thank you. I think that's all the questions so far. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening and thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Philippa, thank you for a wonderful insight into transport and driving and the little robots. I, I am delighted to see those cute little robots running along the pavement and I kind of want one and I'm guessing most of the audience would quite like one now. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insight onto transport. Um, thank you everybody for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>